separate A steadfast love that can't escape Your faithfulness and endless sin So full of grace and mercy We see God is so Your kindness show in all your ways. We see God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to is 
Good morning, church. We're so glad to be with you in your home. Hope you're doing well this Sunday morning. Hey, if you'll look up on the screen above us, we're going to confess this together. We're confessing Philippians 4, verses 4 through 6 this morning. I hope it strengthens your soul this morning. Let's do that together now. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's our prayer for you this morning. That if you're anxious, if you're worried, fears in your heart, just re be reminded. God of the universe is looking after you, caring for you, caring for the people that you care about. Cast your cares on him this morning. Come to him with a thankful heart. Ask him for what you need this morning. Lord, we just bless you. We thank, we're so thankful that you're all those things. You're so good to us, God. Amen.
hallelujah. Come on, let's let your hallelujah rise this morning from wherever you are. Your church is hallelujah. And we praise you, Jesus. Oh, we praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Jesus. We are a church scattered right now. I really, really wish we were together. I miss my friends. I miss seeing the faces of our members. I miss being in the presence of all of the lovely people who come to our church and call this home. I miss hearing the sound of their voices as we sing together. I miss those moments when the Spirit is obviously moving among us. Those special moments when it just seems like everybody, everybody can sense it. I miss being able to preach to people that I can see. And I'm sure our band misses leading people that they can see in worship of your holy name. But Lord, despite all of these obstacles and despite this sadness, we know that right now, the same spirit of Jesus who is in me, who is in the folks that are on this stage with me, the same spirit of Jesus is in the members of our church, the followers of Jesus who call renewal home. And even though we can't see each other, we can't feel each other, we don't, we're so far from one another, we know that we are one in the Spirit. And we thank you, God, for that miracle that we are truly one in the Spirit. And so I ask in Jesus' name for something special this morning that we would all treat the next few minutes with sacredness, that we would handle this time well together, that we would come to God's word together and conclude with the Lord's Supper together even though we're so far apart and that there would be a sense in each of us of our oneness in Jesus, that we truly are of Jesus and we belong to one another. We are unified in him. I pray your blessings over every single person watching this video. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As I said a few moments ago in my prayer, guys, um, I miss you. It's, um, I was out for a run this morning and I was... I ran into the street to avoid coming near two women who were coming, who were in my path and who were coming toward me. And as I was passing, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that it was one of the members of our church. And I was able to say, hey. And so that was really nice to see. And um, uh, the things that we take for granted, the things that we take for granted. Um, we're going to be continuing on with our series on uh, the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to be jumping ahead this week over to Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. Um, I want to, uh, I think this is the, really the perfect message for the context that we find ourselves in right now with this pandemic that's going around. Um, it is a, it's a message about anxiety. Uh, five times in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus uses the word anxiety. And so we're going to be drilling into that today. But before we get started in earnest, I want to encourage you to go do something really quick. And that is, go and grab um, something to drink and something to eat. Preferably a piece of bread, a cracker, um, and uh, maybe a, a glass of juice of some sort. Um, and we're going to be taking the Lord's Supper together at the end of today's message. I'm still going to do the Lord's Supper. Um, I, again, I want to apologize for uh, the technical difficulties last week. We've got those ironed out, but I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry that that happened last week. And I want to remind you that our weekly corporate protocols that we have moving forward are, we want to, we want to touch you in three different ways. Beyond, um, beyond our video communications that we're having and our FaceTiming and Google Hangouts that we're having where we're meeting with people and counseling and talking with people, uh, every Wednesday we're going to do a video blog. Uh, mostly that'll be me doing those, and the purpose of that video blog is to advise you of any developments in the church, but mostly it's to simply put a smile on your face and to fill your heart with hope. 
And then on Friday, we're going to release an e-newsletter. And uh, we did that this last Friday. And if for some reason you didn't receive that e-newsletter in your email inbox, we don't have your information. And so reach out to us at 901-751-3333 or email us at info at renewalmemphis.com. We'll make sure that we, you get that uh, e-newsletter. And it's filled with stuff from how to do family devotionals to uh, doing crafts with your kids that uh, the ladies from Clubhouse and Kids Ministry are helping you with to encouraging ways and strategies to do community together. This last week, my community gathered through a Zoom video conference and we had the best time together. It wasn't perfect, but it was the best time. It was so encouraging. We got to pray for one another and express some of the things that we were feeling. And so, uh, and then on Sunday, of course, we have our, uh, our service streamed. So uh, just keep, your, keep, your, uh, keep that in your mind. And, and again, take a moment, if you haven't yet, go grab a piece of bread or a cracker or something to drink. And at the end of today's message, I'm going to lead us in the Lord's Supper as a scattered church. Um, nothing is more important, in my opinion, in my opinion, than the practice of the faith in these turbulent times. And I want to emphasize the word practice. Nothing is more important, in my opinion, than the authentic, intentional practice of the faith. Some, it's, it's, more, it's a Christianity that's more than just hanging on and hoping that God's going to get us through this. Um, and and I, granted, we, many of us probably feel that way right now, and, and I do in, in some ways. But I'm talking about something where we can be um, intentional in how we lean into Jesus and how we can wrap our minds and arms around this unprecedented time that we find ourselves in, this world pandemic. Um, it's times like these that disturbingly clarify our inner lives. Is our faith uh, mostly sentimental? Is it built on popular Bible verses and memes that are intended to more to be pick-me-ups and add-ons? Um, nothing wrong with those things, Please understand me, nothing wrong with those things. But does that constitute the majority of what it looks like for us to be a Christian? Um, is it mainly sentimental? Or is our faith mostly cognitive on the other side or intellectual? Uh, maybe we enjoy doctrine and Bible studies and the like, and yet there still exists a gulf between our brains and our hearts. It's in times like these that maybe we're beginning to realize that knowing doctrine is not the same thing exactly as abiding in Jesus. That's important to know. I don't know what ways that um, this season of separation and change, um, what it's done to you, what it's surfaced in your heart, the thoughts and the feelings that you have that it's brought to light. Um, but I'm going to tell you that sentimentalism and intellectualism on the other side don't provide the tools that we need to be able to navigate these tough times. They don't provide those tools. They're helpful. Doctrine, Bible studies, all those things are helpful. Verses of the day, blogs that we read, they are helpful. But I want to remind us that only Jesus is the one who can give us the tools to navigate these times. Only the person of Jesus as we abide in him and as we seek his face. And hopefully the distinction that I'm making here is going to make more sense as we get into the rest of this message. Um, Jesus was happy. And Jesus was at peace. He is at peace. <laughs> Jesus was deeply fulfilled. And Jesus was always emotionally present with the people that he was with. And Jesus invites us into this joy and this peace. I want you to know that. Jesus invites you into this joy and in this peace, into this peace. But it does bring up a question. How do I make this change? How do I transition into a life of abiding in Jesus? How do I live in such a way that I really do find my strength in him? Like in a real way, what are real practices? What does that look like to cultivate that kind of a life? How do I avoid being crushed by whatever happens in these unprecedented and disturbing times? 
How can I be liberated and delivered from my anxiety and my fear? Um, And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And so I'm going to invite you to open your Bibles um, or scroll to Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to read 10 verses. Uh, We're going to read Matthew 6 verses 25 through 34. And uh, if you were with me, I would say, would you please stand for the reading of the Word of God? Uh, And you can if you want, where you are. Uh, The Scripture says this in verse 25 of Matthew 6. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you O you of little faith. And when you hear, O you of little faith, don't hear a condemning voice. Hear compassion. Jesus loves his children, and he wants them not to be controlled by fear, but by faith. Therefore, he says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, people who are not a part of the family of God, that's the context here, seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so I led off with this morning's message by bringing up the point of practice. That it's my opinion that it is practice, the practice of the faith, that is going to give us the resources, the tools, and the strength to navigate this time, not just to survive, but so that our spiritual life, our emotional life, thrives through this time. And so I want to bring your attention back to something that happened in this text that we just read that's really, really interesting. At least I find it very interesting. There are five rhetorical questions that Jesus asks in this text. Five. Five rhetorical questions. And it is my belief that he writes, he gives us these rhetorical questions so that we would ponder these questions and ponder them deeply. Now, here's what I find kind of interesting about this text. He spends a couple of verses earlier talking about divorce, a pretty thorny, controversial issue. He spends a few verses talking about lust and sexual immorality. He spends a few verses talking about anger and unforgiveness and bitterness. He spends a few verses talking about loving our enemies. He spends a few verses talking about what prayer looks like. And then when he gets to the issue of anxiety, There's this chunk of Scripture, 10 verses, 10 verses of Scripture, and over and over and over through this text, Jesus does something interesting. He asks these rhetorical questions, these questions that are intended to lead us into his message, to take us away from this posture of, hmm, interesting, to one in which we lean in and we place ourselves in this story, in this teaching. Why does Jesus do that? These questions I would submit to you are not intended to be answered once. Don't you realize that you're more valuable than the birds of the air? Yes. These aren't yes and no questions. These are questions that invite engagement and uh, contemplation and pondering, and I would submit to you that these are questions, especially throughout this pandemic, this crisis, these are questions that we should be interacting with every single day in a thoughtful and honest way. 
These questions are intended to bridge the gulf between our minds and our hearts. He's moving us from listening with our brains and listening cognitively to listening with our souls in this text. These questions are Jesus' way of reeling us into his sermon so that we can deeply internalize the truth that he is teaching us. This is about how to uproot anxiety. And my friends, we all know that anxiety isn't just in our brain cells. Anxiety is in our guts. Anxiety is in our hands as they, sh- as they shimmer and they shake because if we're nervous, we're anxious, we're fearful, we're worried. Anxiety is part of us. It is visceral. It is visceral. And so Jesus doesn't seek to only meet us in the brain. He wants us to descend into the heart and to the soul because that is where anxiety is rooted. And if we're going to get out of it, we're going to have to go there. We all know that anxiety is not a button that we push to turn it on or turn it off. If we could do that, nobody would struggle with anxiety. Anxiety is visceral. It's entrenched in each of our stories. And in order to address the anxiety and the captivating worry in our lives, we're going to have to go where it lives, our hearts. I want you to note, Jesus uses, he uses illustrations and anecdotes, and they're all about nature. They're all about beauty. He talks about the birds of the air. And he has observations about the birds of the air. Jesus is letting us into his way of life. He has spent time looking at the birds of the air and noticing, wow, the birds of the air, they carry, about, carry along in their lives. They build their dwelling places, their nests, yes. They look for food, they feed their young, they live lives of productivity, and yet at the same time, I don't see anxiety or worry in the lives of birds. And then Jesus takes our focus off of a bird and reminds us that, Are we not of more value than the birds to God the Father? He's inviting us to feel this, to, if you will, possess this story, to live in these illustrations with him. He talks about lilies of the field that are beautiful, that God cares for. He talks about the grass that's here one day, then gone the next. He talks about Solomon, who was clothed in all of his beauty and all of his majesty. Solomon being like the Jewish archetype for success and glory and majesty and wealth and power and security. And he says that those of us who have come under the kingdom of God and live under the reign of God and follow the ways of Jesus, we have more wealth and care and security than Solomon. Jesus is inviting us to feel these things. He wants us to live in the nature and the beauty. He wants us to smell the air. He wants us to smell the rain. He wants us to look around. He wants us to get outside, outdoors, and walk and notice creation because the scriptures teach us that God, his obvious reality is written into the creation if we would only look, if we would only look. And so it's my strong conviction that many of us in the church neglect an essential component of transformation in our lives. It is my opinion that many of us have a missing ingredient in the batch of transformation. And that missing ingredient is the practice of contemplation. I'm not necessarily talking about Christian mysticism here, if that raises any of your eyebrows. I am talking simply about what contemplation means. To look thoughtfully at something for a long time. To look thoughtfully at something for a long time. But this is why so many of us don't do it. To invite someone into contemplation, into pondering, into thinking, into feeling, means that we must necessarily slow down. And our whole society, at least in the Western world, is built not on practice because our lives are built on anxious activity. And we say things like, I'm too busy and I don't have time. 
And this is no more evident, perhaps, than how we cope with fear and worry and defeat in our lives. We speed up. We speed up. We take over. We binge. We veg out. We instinctively move away from our hearts so that we don't have to feel the pain and work through the defeat. And the problem with that is, is that as we move away from our hearts, we're necessarily moving away from Jesus because that's where Jesus connects with us. If you're studying God's word, God's word is gonna speak to you in your heart. If you're in prayer and there's a sensation that God might be speaking to you or touching you or healing you in a certain way, you're feeling that, you're experiencing that in your heart. And if we don't look at our hearts, then we're not looking at God. And so we've got this practice of moving away, of, of, of suppressing everything that we're feeling so we don't have to feel it. And I want to encourage you, the things that I'm telling you to do here are not about making your life more difficult. I know a lot of people have a false assumption about the Sermon on the Mount. When Jesus says that this is the narrow way and few take the narrow path, we assume that what he means is, is that living in the kingdom of God is really, 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 really hard. And that's not what Jesus is saying. He simply means it's compressed and few take it because it's a, it's, a, it's a road that not many take. Life is hard on either side. If you're living for Jesus or not for Jesus, life is hard. Doesn't it make sense that if we're going to live this life that we live it the way that Jesus lives it, who did suffer and yet was happy and fulfilled and at peace and emotionally present? That makes sense to me. And I want you guys to have this. I know that many of you right now have experienced a loss of your job. You've experienced diminished or an elimination of your income. Many of you are worried about uh, your health insurance and what that might look like if, by, uh, 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 if you get coronavirus, uh, God forbid. Many of you have these questions. Many of you are struggling right now. How are you gonna pay your mortgage? How are you gonna pay your bills? Is the government going to give us some money and is it going to be enough? Or is it just going to be uh, the proverbial spit in the bucket? We have all of these worries. And while I can't make any promises that I can fix those or change those, I can tell you this, that following the teachings of Jesus can uproot the anxiety that might be controlling you and heal you. And so I just want to take a moment and walk through these five questions. Um, six times anxiety is used. And so I want to invite you for a moment to validate your fear. There is a difference between fear and the possessive kind of fear that leads to a life of anxiety. Just because you feel fear doesn't mean that you're sinning or you're doing something wrong. We all feel fear in this life. It's what you do with the fear that you're feeling. And so if you're feeling fear, I want you to know God is with you. God loves you and he has compassion on you and he wants to deliver you from that fear uh, morphing into something darker and something more toxic in our lives. Remember, anxiety is visceral. It's visceral. It's not merely addressed by believing the right thing or singing the right worship song. It is about descending into our hearts and learning how to put down new patterns and new rhythms of thinking and, and living. And so here are the five rhetorical questions that Jesus gives. In verse 25, he says, Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And remember, Jesus is not looking for a yes and no answer here. Jesus is looking for revelation. He is looking at the eyes of his people who are listening to him, and he wants to see the lights turn on as people realize, Oh my goodness, you're right, Rabbi. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. You're right. You're right. And so he's calling us to see life as more than just survival. More than just survival. And then in verse 26, the end of verse 26, he says, Are you not of more value than they, or he, what he means, the birds of the air? Are you not of more value than the birds of the air? Well, that's an obvious yes and no question, but it's more than that. He wants us to feel a realization, to have a realization, yes, I am of more value than the birds of the air. 
God has not forgotten about me. God does not prefer other human beings over me. God knows me. He knows where I am. He knows my fears. He knows my hurts. He feels them with me, and he is with me navigating my life. I can trust in a good, good God. And if you read all this text, it's obvious that God being good is not just a cliche for Jesus. Jesus has a deep conviction that the Father is good. He is good. And he's calling us to live in God's goodness. He's calling us to live that way. Number three, verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan. It's interesting, in some translations, it says rather than a single hour, it says cubit. And cubit in the ancient world was a, was a measurement. And typically it meant from the tip of your finger to your elbow. And so the translation's a little wonky here because they weren't sure if he meant, can you add a cubit to your height or can you add a cubit to your length of life? But regardless, both of those ideas are preposterous. In my worry, I cannot make myself get taller. I can't do it. No matter how hard I try, there's no way that I can make myself taller, much less a cubit taller. In my worry and anxiety, there's no way that if you take all the years that God gives me on this planet, I could not add the length of my fingertip to my elbow, to my life. It's futile. I can't do it. I am powerless. And so Jesus doesn't, doesn't trick us here. He doesn't introduce us to this life that's worry-free and problem-free. He's also helping us to see the reality of life, the, the, the tension that we live in, that God is good, and yet at the same time, we have no control. We have no control. And he's calling us to forfeit control. And to forfeit control for us is to forfeit, learn to forfeit worry, because worry won't change what happens today or tomorrow or anything after that. Worry is futile. Now again, he's not looking for his hearers to go, hmm, that's a good point, Jesus. He's looking for his hearers to so deeply internalize this that they have a growing conviction that, you know, it's just kind of dumb that I worry sometimes. I'm just learning more and more day by day that worry is just such a silly thing to do because I have no control. And I can move toward God and trust in him. The fourth rhetorical question, and why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about clothing? Why are you anxious about clothing? He introduces us to material needs here. I don't think I'm embellishing in a wrong way by saying that, why are you anxious about toilet paper? Why are you anxious about milk? Why are you anxious about all the things that people are cleaning off the shelves right now. Jesus, in this text, compares the people of God to Gentiles, and he says, Gentiles strive after these things. They strive after what they're going to wear. They strive over caring for themselves. They trust in themselves. There was an interview that I heard a couple of days ago. It was uh, uh, this poor man in, in New York City who had to shut down his business. I don't know if this man followed Jesus or not. That it, was a, it wasn't a Christian podcast per se. And the person interviewing him asked him what he was feeling. And he said, he said these words, something along these lines. He said, I have always known how to fix my life with my own power and my own strength. And now I'm, I've, I'm totally powerless and I don't know what to do. That almost sounds like the lyric in a Christian worship song. But these are what people all around the world are waking up to every day, this sense of powerlessness. And Jesus is identifying that the Gentiles who don't have God as their father, who have not embraced Jesus as their Lord and, and see Yahweh, the God of Israel, as their God, these are people who don't have those resources to trust in a good and loving father, and yet the people of God, we do. We don't have to strive for those things. Rather, we strive, he says in verses 32 and 33, for the rule and the reign of God in our lives. That's what we strive for. And Jesus says that if you seek first or seek above all things the rule and the reign of God, all these things will be added to you. What things? Toilet paper? Clothes? Milk? Income? I don't know what that looks like. Jesus isn't promising us 
that he's gonna give us everything that we want. But he is promising that he will take care of us. He will take care of us. And then there's our fifth question, verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And again, I don't think he's condemning his followers here, his listeners. I think he's reaching out a hand of empathy. And he sees these children. Yeah, he wants them to grow in their faith. But he sees them as his children, as little ones. And he's pulling them toward himself. All of these rhetorical questions, again, are not just yes and no answers. Jesus is not requiring us to give the right answer here. Jesus is saying to us that if you want to uproot anxiety in your life, you are going to have to deeply interact with these questions. Deeply interact with them. So what I've done in my life is I have set up time every day to take these questions and to go on a walk outside. It's one of the gifts of this harrowing time that we find ourselves is that spring is happening. I know we've had a lot of rain, but spring is happening. And there are beautiful plants and trees that are blooming and the air is getting warmer. And we can take a daily walk alone with, our, with a friend, six feet apart, albeit, uh, with our family. And as we do that, I wanna encourage you to take these, these five, five questions and just thoughtfully walk through those questions and notice around you, look around. You're not trying to get through these questions. Your goal is to internalize deeply these questions so that the answers to these questions, the right answers to these questions aren't just up here, but they're in here. And they become visceral here. They become visceral here. Um, my friends, I love you. I truly do. Our staff loves you. Our elders love you. Our leadership loves you. We miss you. We miss seeing your faces. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to say a prayer. And then I'm going to lead us briefly in communion. And uh, then make a couple of announcements to conclude uh, today's broadcast. Jesus, I thank you for my dear brothers and sisters watching this. I thank you once again that we are one in the Spirit. I thank you for your love, for your care. And I thank you that you have called us. You have called us to abide in you. To deeply internalize the truth of who you are in your word. And I thank you that as we do this practice, that we will experience deliverance in our lives from the grasp of anxiety and fear. And we can emerge from this season that's really disturbing and scary, stronger, sturdier, less fearful, more courageous, all for the glory of God and for the joy of people. In Jesus' name. Um, if you've got some bread, I want to encourage you to break that bread. Break that bread. And I want to encourage you to get a piece of that bread. Get a piece of that bread. And I want to remind you that even though we are separated from each other, we are together in the Spirit. The Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My brothers and sisters, take and eat this bread. And remember that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper. This is what he said. This cup 
is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So my dear brothers and sisters, take, drink, remember, and believe that the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was shed for the complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. I want to encourage you, my friends, to connect with us. Connect with your church. I heard someone say in a podcast this week we need that we, if, we want to, uh, if we want to starve our fears, we need to feed our faith. If we, want to, if we want to starve our fears, we must feed our faith. And the scriptures tell us not to forsake assembling together. And by God's grace in this digital age, we can still assemble, so to speak. I want to encourage you to please be faithful in attending on Sundays, the Lord's Day, gather with the Lord's people. Please, I beg you to do this. And I don't say this just for my own benefit or that of the churches, but for yours, for yours as well. Um, Now more than ever, we need you to be faithful with your financial contributions to the church. We have some members who have not felt this yet. We have other members who've been devastated by this who are facing a lot of fear and a lot of uncertainty. And as a church, we are committed to doing whatever we possibly can to support the members of our family. We have a fund that you can give to on our website. That's an emergency fund for families in our church that are financially struggling. But we also need you to continue, if possible, with your financial contributions to the church. And we're asking everyone to please begin to give totally online. Just go to RenewalMemphis.com slash give. RenewalMemphis.com slash give. And if for some reason this isn't feasible for you, you can mail in a check to us uh, at Renewal Church, P.O. Box 381-964, Germantown, Tennessee, 38138. My friends, we love you. If you need anything, if you need care, counseling, encouragement, anything, please reach out to us. We are available to you and we love you. My God, I pray your blessings over your people. I pray in Jesus' name that they would know the power of the resurrection of Jesus in their lives. I pray, oh Jesus, that through this time of uncertainty and even suffering, that we would better know the sufferings of Jesus and that our intimacy with Jesus would increase, our dependence on Jesus would grow. And I pray that each of us would emerge from this season stronger, more dependent on you. I pray for healing over every single person in our church and our city and beyond, but specifically our church. I pray that you would protect us from the COVID-19 virus. I pray, Jesus, for speedy recoveries. We pray, oh God, right now for the nation of Italy, who are, they're losing hundreds of people to death every day because of this terrible virus. And oh God, our hearts are broken at the desperation in that country and other parts of the world. And we pray, Jesus, that you would move into these areas and do a work of renewal and grace and healing and salvation. We thank you, God, for your mercy. And in this very, very strange time, we look to you and we thank you and we depend on you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, my dear friends.